Chair, Director of the Department of Public Health. And I want to thank all of you uh, for joining us here for this virtual town hall on the COVID-19 vaccines. There have been many new developments since we met a little more than a month ago, and we want to share as much information as possible since we know there are so many questions. I'm very happy to be joined by my colleagues at the Department of Public Health, Dr. Davis, the LA County Health Officer, Dr. Tarashita from the Acute Communicable Disease Control Program, Dr. Sarah Curran, the Director of Medical Affairs, and Dr. Yagane, a physician with the Department of Public Health and a pediatrician. To start, I want to tell you a little bit about how the town hall will go. Uh, we're going to begin with some brief remarks from our panelists and then spend the rest of our time answering your questions. As a reminder, you can send in your questions in the chat on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. And I also want to know that if you, um, if you want to uh, hear the, uh, the town hall tonight in a different language on the screen are the different languages. Uh, para la gente que habla en español, pueden marcar el 888-664-1453 para escuchar en español. I know there are many people who see our case rates decreasing alongside our dropping hospitalization and death rates and think we must be getting back to normal now. Why are we still pushing vaccines and living with restrictions like masking requirements and even adding requirements like vaccination mandates? These are reasonable questions and I think it's helpful in responding to these concerns to look at some information about what's going on in the rest of the country. Here in LA County, where 59% of our population is fully vaccinated, masks are required of almost everyone in indoor settings, and vaccines are mandated for many specific groups of people. In New York City, where 62% of the population is fully vaccinated, vaccines are required for indoor dining, fitness centers, and performance venues. Yet in Texas and Florida, where 51% and 56% of their state's populations have been fully vaccinated, state leaders have moved to ban mask and vaccine requirements in almost all settings. When comparing the case rates in the two weeks before September 18th, there were 250 to 280 cases for every 100,000 people living in LA County and New York City. While if you look at the numbers for Texas and Florida for the same two week period, the, num the new case rates were about 800 people, 800 new cases for every 100,000 people. That's about three times higher than what we're seeing here and in New York City. And here and in New York City, we saw four and two deaths for every 100 people and our hearts break for everyone who passes away. While in Texas, they saw 12 deaths for every 100,000 people and Florida saw 22 deaths per 100,000 people. This is a three to five fold difference compared to what we're seeing here in LA County. Different case and death rates aren't just happening to us. They're a product of the collective actions that we're taking. Businesses and people who live in different communities change these numbers when they adopt rules that add layers of protection against a deadly virus. This includes wearing masks, getting tested and vaccinated, and agreeing to live with restrictions that reduce opportunities for transmission, especially in our highest risk settings. In places where sensible steps have not been taken to reduce the spread of this virus, the Delta strain continues to ruin futures and take lives at a rapid pace. Until community transmission is low and vaccination coverage is much higher, prevention strategies are essential to our collective well being and our economic recovery. Waiting until spread again is once more very high before acting doesn't reflect the reality of this pandemic and the destructive potential of the virus. Let's join together and use the tools we have to effectively reduce the risk of transmission and keep each other healthy and safe. We've received hundreds of questions tonight, and while I know we're not gonna to get to all of them, we'll do our very best to answer as many as possible. We hope that by sharing important information and answering your questions, 
we're going to continue our work together to protect our loved ones and our county colleagues. Now, Dr. Davis will talk more about COVID-19, and he'll provide updates on our recent vaccination verification health officer order. Thank you, Dr. Ferrer, and good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for joining this town hall. Uh, I'd like to start tonight by giving a general update on the state of COVID-19 in LA County. Uh, case rates continue to decline among all unvaccinated and vaccinated racial and ethnic groups, with the highest rates still among Latinx and Black unvaccinated residents. Looking at case rates or cases by age group, uh, we see that the highest case rates are among unvaccinated teens ages 12 to 17 years, while vaccinated members of this group have the lowest case rates, indicating that the vaccine is extremely protective from infections in teens. The second highest case rates are among unvaccinated young adults aged 18 to 49 and unvaccinated adults 50 and older. Of all the unvaccinated groups, the lowest case rates are among children zero to 11 years of age. Because this age group remains ineligible for the vaccines, they are all, of course, unvaccinated. It's good to also know the case rates among unvaccinated 12 to 17 year olds peaked in mid-August around the time that most LA County school districts reopened. Since then, case rates in this group uh, have decreased following trends uh, in adult pop populations, affirming that schools indeed are a relatively safe place for schools this age, I mean, for children this age. To aid in lowering of case rates, uh, we also modified the health officer order and updated youth sports uh, guidance with screening testing requirements for athletes, staff, coaches, and volunteers. These modifications include guidance for indoor, moderate, or high-risk sports for children of all ages and for outdoor moderate high-risk sports for youth 12 years and older. A weekly negative COVID-19 diagnostic test may be required for youth coaches and staff to participate depending on the sport and its location. Weekly screening tests are required in school settings uh, can be used to fulfill this obligation, obligation for testing in youth sports. Fully vaccinated youth participating in outdoor sports are not required to test weekly unless there is a positive case among players, coaches, and or staff. If there is a positive case, all players, coaches, staff, and volunteers, regardless of vaccination status, are required to have a weekly negative test result for two weeks from exposure to the case and must test negative prior to competitions. Screening test is not required or are not required for youth under 12 playing outdoor sports. More information about this updated guidance can be found on the reopeninglacounty.com website. As evidence mounts affirming the effectiveness and safety of COVID-19 vaccines, targeted vaccination requirements to protect the safety of populations at risk for infection are increasingly becoming a critical part of policy strategies for preventing future surges of COVID and ending this pandemic. Targeted requirements are both uh, able to create additional safety for both workers and the public at workplaces, schools, establishments, and events. And as more people get vaccinated, there is wider protection and a lower risk of spread in the community. Healthcare workers in our county, including EMTs, paramedics, dental workers, and home healthcare workers are required to be fully vaccinated by September 30th. Government employees are subject to several requirements, including an LA County directive issued by a board chair executive order and ratified by the board requiring county employees to be vaccinated by October 1st. An LA city mandate uh, requiring city employees to be vaccinated by October 5th and a federal mandate requiring vaccination among federal workers and contractors, as well as healthcare workers in Medicare and Medicaid funded settings. On Friday, September 17th, a health officer order was issued with two new safety requirements. It will require outdoor mega events to implement systems to verify proof of full vaccination against COVID-19 or a recent negative COVID-19 diagnostic test beginning October 7th. And it will require bars, breweries, wineries, distilleries, lounges, and nightclubs to verify at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccination beginning October 7th and full vaccination against COVID-19 beginning uh, November 4th. 
the requirement for vaccination verification for customers in the indoor portions of bars, wineries, breweries, nightclubs, and lounges, and their on-site employees applies to those establishments with either no restaurant permit or a low-risk restaurant permit. These establishments primarily serve adults and already require patrons to show proof of age. And while children do not usually enter these establishments, children under 12 are exempt from these requirements. Those customers that do not show proof of vaccination may be served and participate in the outdoor portions of the facility where the risk of exposure to COVID-19 is less likely when compared to indoors. Although our health officer order doesn't require uh, vaccine verification at indoor portions of restaurants, we strongly recommend this. We are preparing toolkits that businesses can use to confirm vaccinations and verify negative test results and providing education to support those establishments by requesting assistance with these efforts. This modified health officer order aligns with the continued need to reduce the risk of COVID-19 transmission and increase vaccination coverage, offering a reasonable path forward in the absence of physical distancing requirements and capacity limits which can position us to better be able to break the cycle of surges that we've seen over the past 20 months. These requirements are designed to protect the health of employees and patrons and to make workplaces safer. While indoor masking and quarantine and isolation of cases uh, in close contacts are effective strategies for reducing transmission, the quickest way to slow the spread is to increase vaccination coverage or the number of people vaccinated or protected uh, by one of the COVID-19 vaccines. Ultimately, the goal is to lower the number of cases of COVID-19 and to prevent as many serious illnesses and deaths as possible. If you still need to get vaccinated, public health and our many vaccination providers can help. There are vaccination sites across our county, and you can find one near you at vaccinatelacounty.com or at vacunatelosangeles.com. We're very grateful to everyone who is doing their part to slow transmission and to keep uh, themselves and others safe. The actions you are taking are working. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Don Tereshita. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. The past few weeks have brought some major headlines in the news about COVID-19 vaccines, particularly on the topic of boosters. With so much new information now available about booster doses, I'd like to share some data from recent studies about the vaccine effectiveness and the rationale for boosters in some populations. The results of a study that was published last week, the CDC indicated that all FDA-approved COVID vaccine regimens provided a very high level of protection against hospitalizations for COVID in real-world settings during the surge of the Delta variant. Vaccine efficacy did vary a bit among the vaccine brands. Between two and four months after vaccination, Moderna vaccines reduced COVID hospitalizations by 93%, while vaccine effectiveness against hospitalizations was 88% for Pfizer vaccine and 71% for Johnson & Johnson vaccines. Antibody levels in healthy adult vaccine recipients two to six weeks after vaccination are highest among those receiving Moderna vaccine slightly lower among those receiving Pfizer vaccine and lower still among those receiving Johnson & Johnson. The durability of vaccine protection was also assessed after the four month mark for those who received the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. At four months, Moderna was still highly protective, preventing 92% of hospitalizations, while Pfizer's protective effect against hospitalizations had waned 77%. No data were published on the durability of Johnson & Johnson vaccine because there were too few recipients of this vaccine in the subgroup for an analysis of the data. These data, along with information received from Pfizer and other studies, provide the rationale behind the Food and Drug Administration's recommendation yesterday in support of providing the third booster doses of Pfizer vaccine to a subset of people, including older adults. Yesterday's recommendation indicated that the third doses should be administered at least six months after the second of two doses of Pfizer vaccine and should be offered to adults 65 and over, as well as adults younger than 65 at high risk of severe COVID due to underlying health conditions. And younger and adults younger than 65 with high institutional or occupational risk. FDA did not recommend boosters for people below the age of 18 
or for people who had received doses of other vaccines. Today, again, we had a lot of news. CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices met and voted on who should receive booster doses. Before I detail the results of their vote, I want to note that this vote does not constitute a CDC recommendation. We expect CDC leadership to consider the ACIP's input and make an agency recommendation in the next few days. ACIP voted to recommend that the third doses should be administered at least six months after the last dose of the two-dose Pfizer series in adults 65 and over, residents of long-term care facilities, people aged 18 to 64 with underlying medical conditions based on individual benefit and risk. Now, after we receive the CDC agency director's recommendation, we will work with the state and our local partners to ensure that those eligible for boosters under the FDA emergency use authorization are able to get their third dose while prioritizing reaching those at most risk, as identified by the CDC. Additionally, on August 23rd, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA fully approved the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for those who are 16 and over. Previously, Pfizer was given the emergency approval or EUA and remains that way for 12 to 15 year olds. This approval is a big milestone and gives us more fuel for the fight against COVID-19 in this pandemic. Extremely rigorous guidelines were set for all the available vaccines and their emergency use authorizations. With Pfizer receiving a full approval, it certainly cements its place as an effective and safe way to protect yourself from the most devastating effects of COVID-19. It is important to note that even with this approval, the scrutiny and monitoring will not fade. The FDA and CDC have systems in place that continue to ensure the safety of the vaccine. Long-term studies will continue to be conducted and reported on. As mentioned by Dr. Davis and Dr. Ferrer, the vaccine continues to be our most powerful tool, and our data shows that week after week, we have successfully increased vaccination and reduced cases. The vaccine is extremely effective at preventing COVID severe infection and death. We highly, highly encourage anyone who is eligible to get vaccinated. Doing so may save your life and the lives of others. Thank you. And I'll now turn it over to Dr. Sarah Curran. Thank you, Dr. Parasita. Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to be part of today's town hall, and I'd like to give you some more information about how to get COVID-19 vaccinations in LA County. If you have not been vaccinated yet and are interested in visiting outdoor mega events, indoor portions of bars, lounges, nightclubs, breweries, wineries, and distilleries, you should consider getting the vaccine as soon as possible so you will be fully protected by the time the requirements go into effect in October. Proof of vaccination will be required in the form of a white vaccination card you receive at the vaccination site or an electronic version that can be stored on your phone. The COVID-19 vaccine is free and available to everyone age 12 and older, and there are more than 800 vaccination sites across LA County, many of which do not require an appointment. You can find locations and appointments at vaccinatelacounty.com or at vacunate los angeles on that website, you can simply put in your zip code and a list of the closest locations will populate on your screen. You may find that there is a location just a few miles from where you are right now. Please note that if you are age 18 or older, you will need to show proof of age at the vaccination site, but you will not be required to show government issued ID and you do not need to be a US citizen to get a vaccine. If you are aged 12 to 17, you should choose a location that offers the Pfizer vaccine. And this is because both the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccines are only authorized for use with people age 18 and over. Currently, there isn't a vaccine available for anyone under the age of 12, although it is expected that Pfizer will be granted emergency use for ages 5 to 11 by the end of the month. As Dr. Tereshita mentioned, we are preparing to administer booster doses for residents who receive the Pfizer vaccine. The easiest way to plan for your booster is to make an appointment at one of the hundreds of sites that offer Pfizer vaccines. You will be able to make an appointment for a booster using the MyTurn system, which should be ready for booster dose appointments by tomorrow. 
or by making an appointment at a pharmacy or clinic that offers vaccinations. To make an appointment using MyTurn, click on the button for additional doses, attest that you are eligible based on the new federal criteria, and go ahead and make your appointment. There are also many places that don't require appointments. Again, you can go to vaccinatelacounty.com to find a community location near you where you can walk in and get your booster. All you will need to bring with you to get your booster dose is proof that you have received two previous Pfizer doses, which for most people will be in the form of the white vaccination card you received when you got those vaccinations, or a photo of your white card or a digital record of your two doses. At many sites, you may be asked to sign an attestation form at the time you get your booster shot, indicating that you did meet the criteria to receive the shot. And if you are in an eligible group, but you receive vaccines other than the Pfizer vaccine, you will likely need to wait until the FDA reviews the data about the need for and safety of Moderna and J&J boosters. And as a reminder, you can call the DPH vaccine call center at 833-540-540. 0473 if you need transportation to a vaccination site or if you are homebound. The call center is open daily from 8 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. and information is also available in multiple languages 24-7 by calling 211. For more information, again, you can visit vaccinatelacounty.com. We are also currently administering third doses to those who are immunocompromised and receive the Moderna or Pfizer vaccines. The FDA approved this third dose for this sector of people, and they should be vaccinated with the same vaccine they received for the first and second dose. But if that is not possible, receiving a third dose with another mRNA vaccine is acceptable. Individuals who qualify for a third dose include organ transplant recipients, people undergoing cancer treatment, people with advanced or untreated HIV, and those on certain immunosuppressive medications. We encourage everyone who qualifies for a third dose to speak to their healthcare provider to confirm their eligibility and get vaccinated. Third doses of vaccines will be accessible through vaccination sites that currently offer Pfizer or Moderna vaccines, and eligible individuals will be able to provide a self-attestation that they have a qualifying medical condition at these sites. At this time, a follow-up dose is not currently recommended for those who have received a single dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The FDA is still evaluating data on additional doses of the J&J &J vaccine. I encourage everyone to visit our website, vaccinatelacounty.com or vacunatelosangeles.com. Not only can you find vaccination site locations there, but there's a lot of helpful information about the vaccine and what you need to know before getting vaccinated. Lastly, if your employer has recently mandated a vaccine, encourage them to hold a vaccination site at your place of work. This can be arranged through a number of providers and a direct link to book that can be found right on the front page of the vaccination site, which again is vaccinatelacounty.com. Thank you so much. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Nagena. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for allowing um, me to join you. I wanted to take this time to outline some of the ways that the Department of Public Health continues to work together with schools to implement comprehensive strategies really focused on preventing transmission of COVID in the school setting. In order to keep children's, uh, children safe in school, we're continuing to layer mitigation strategies, doing things like distancing, cohorting, masking, vaccinating those who are vaccine eligible and using screening testing strategies. We're continuing to utilize the strong communication channels that have been built between the Department of Public Health, the Los Angeles County Office of Education, each of the 80 uh, districts, the charter schools, and the independent schools to relay information regarding safety protocols and changes in our guidance. We are so pleased that our schools continue to promote the highest level of safety for students, for staff, for teachers. And because of their efforts, COVID-19 transmission in the school setting remains an uncommon event. Like Dr. Davis mentioned, we've seen case rates decrease by 43% across all age groups. And this decline in case rates, rates among school-aged children is particularly promising, as this is occurring during a time when many of the students have now returned to school. 
We are hopeful that if we continue to pay close attention to school-based strategies that reduce the risk of exposure, we can continue to see lower case rates amongst all the age groups. As Dr. Davis mentioned also, we are extending guidelines for youth sports and are working to keep the compliance to these guidance um, documents at top level. Our goal is to keep students out on the field enjoying their sports with their peers and doing so safely. Along with the guidelines about the masking requirements, vaccinations remain our most powerful tool in creating a safe environment for your child and all the community of people that they come in contact with. While we continue to see the number of vaccinated youth tick upwards, there are still many students who have not been vaccinated. As of last week, 67% of LA County teens 12 to 17 years of age had received one dose of vaccine and 57% were fully vaccinated. With school already underway and the pending holiday and winter seasons amongst us, there isn't any time to waste to get your child vaccinated. So please visit vaccinatelacounty.com to find a vaccination location near you. You can also talk to your child's doctor about getting the vaccine at the clinic. You can also go to your school district as our school districts here in Los Angeles County have hosted over 900 vaccine clinics over the last few months. You may have seen some news about vaccine mandates in the schools. Several independent schools, charter schools, and two large school districts in Los Angeles County, Culver City Unified and Los Angeles Unified School Districts are now requiring that eligible students get vaccinated. For Culver City, their, um, their deadline is November in November, November 19th. And for LAUSD, it's January 10th. Uh, for those who are participating in extracurricular activities like sports, arts, drama at LAUSD, you would be asked to receive your vaccine in October. This, these vaccine mandates are important steps in protecting all our students, teachers, and staff, and will absolutely make a difference in lessening the influence of the pandemic on our children's school activities. These will allow each child to spend more time in the classroom and doing the activities they love best. As Dr. Davis also mentioned, our data is showing us that vaccination in our youth is making a difference. We know that children who are fully vaccinated have infection rates that are far lower than any other groups. Pfizer is the vaccine we have available for our 12 to 17 year old. Um, and earlier this week, the Pfizer BioNTech company did, did announce that they will seek an emergency use authorization for younger age children. So for children aged five to 11 years of age. Once they've submitted all their data to the Food and Drug Administration, the data will be thoroughly reviewed and we will learn about a timeline for uh, being able to vaccinate our younger children later this fall. We also hope that the coming weeks and months will bring us further approvals for other vaccine brands for children. I just wanna reemphasize that safety at schools is amplified many fold and vaccination coverage is very high. And if we have widespread vaccination, it could dramatically reduce the transmission in other settings. And that includes in the classroom, but also school activities, community events, and at home. We're so grateful to all the schools that are doing their part to get those vaccination coverage rates up by hosting informational sessions, by holding vaccination events, and by giving their staff and students time to get the vaccine. We're thankful for the teens and parents who are getting vaccinated and keeping their community safe. I look forward to answering any of your questions tonight. And now I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Ferrer. Uh, thanks so much to all of our panelists uh, for sharing their information with us. Uh, and hopefully we got to answer some of your questions already just by providing uh, so much information. Uh, there is a lot happening. I'm grateful uh, for everybody who's helping us uh, better understand what our tools are gonna be at getting through the next few months and how we can help each other remain safe. I do wanna just um, provide one bit of information before we go ahead and, and take your questions. Um, there are you know, over 3 million people currently eligible for vaccines that haven't gotten their first dose yet. Um, and some, some folks may be waiting uh, because it's hard to get to a vaccination site or there's confusion uh, about whether these vaccines are free. So I, I just wanna be clear, the vaccines are free. The booster will be free as well. Uh, you don't need uh, to, to show any uh, papers uh, uh, documenting your immigration status uh, to get vaccinated and you don't need to have health insurance and there is no cost uh, for anyone. And if you have uh, either questions 
about how to find a place near you to get vaccinated, or you need some help getting transportation to a site, you can call us at our vaccine call center at 833-540-0473. I'm going to repeat that again, 833-540-0473. The center is open uh, every day from 8 in the morning to 8.30 at night. Um, and information is available in multiple languages. Uh, so please, please call us. Uh, here's information on the screen. Um, but we want to hear from you if you need our help uh, getting to a vaccination site for your first dose, your second dose, and for those of you who are going to be eligible for your boosters. Um, with that, I want to go. We, we've gotten uh, dozens and dozens of questions in already. I'm going to start uh, trying to direct the questions, but want to let the panelists know, you know, feel free to jump in uh, at any point. Uh, I'm going to find a primary person, but then, uh, you know, if you've got other additional helpful information, go ahead and, and just jump in. I'm going to start uh, with Dr. Davis. Uh, if I recovered from COVID, but I didn't get the vaccine, am I still allowed to go into a bar uh, after October 7th? Is there a natural immunity pass? Uh, at this time, we, we don't have a, a natural immunity pass. Uh, you know, uh, even though you did, uh, you know, were infected and have recovered uh, from COVID-19, uh, it is still recommended uh, that you be vaccinated. <clears throat> there have been studies that have shown that uh, for those who have recovered, uh, those who were vaccinated after recovery uh, fared better and were still at less risk of getting reinfected. Uh, so at the moment, uh, the the there is a vaccination required. There's no pass for for those who were previously infected. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Tereshita. Does the booster shot mean that Pfizer, the Pfizer vaccine isn't as good as the others? Thanks, Dr. Ferrer. Um, you know that's a good question because what was discussed today and yesterday at FDA and ACIP was the Pfizer vaccine. And the Pfizer vaccine is the one that's discussed because Pfizer is the one that got the documents uh, together and um, applied to the FDA for approval for this booster dose. Um, that's, that's really the only reason. Uh, we expect Moderna and probably Johnson & Johnson to follow at some point, and then those discussions will happen too. So, so no, I don't think that just because the discussion is about Pfizer now, that means it's a better vaccine. If I, can, I would also note that Pfizer was the first to get authorized. So it's been out longer uh, than the others. So it takes time to get that data together. And I do want to note there was, there was a study that was recently released um, by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, that did show there was slight differences um, in the vaccines, the three vaccines that we have, they all were great uh, and at preventing serious illness and obviously at preventing death. Uh, but it was noticeable after four months that Moderna seemed to hold its effectiveness slightly better uh, than the Pfizer vaccines and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. These were relatively small numbers of people that were in these studies um, but there's also some data from Israel that suggests that particularly with the Pfizer vaccine, which is the vaccine that was used almost exclusively in Israel, uh, that after um, uh, many months, uh, the effectiveness of the vaccine, particularly uh, around preventing people from getting infected, seems to wane a bit. Now, again, the numbers are still spectacularly high in terms of the advantages that the vaccines are providing. But one reason why both the FDA and CDC went ahead and felt like it was reasonable for some people uh, to go ahead and get a booster six months after they finished their, uh, in this case, their two doses of Pfizer is because that data is conclusive on showing that some of the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine wanes over time. Uh, it's still, you know, pretty powerful and it's still protecting uh, all of us who have been vaccinated with Pfizer. Uh, but there is that study. Now, as Moderna and Johnson & Johnson go ahead and submit their documents uh, to the CDC and to the FDA, we'll learn more about what their studies are showing in terms of whether or not a booster is needed. But you obviously don't want people to get boosters 
uh, unless they really need the additional protection. So, um, but thanks. So those were these are both great questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Kurian, uh, why and, and this would why is there no information on Moderna and J and J booster shots? So similar to, uh, to what yeah. we talked about. Yeah. So thank you. Um, and I think some of this was already mentioned by you know Dr. Tarashita, by Dr. Ferrer. Um, so the the data on Moderna and J and J booster vaccines are still being evaluated um, by the FDA. And so once that evaluation is completed. Um, we should hear more about whether boosters will be required um, for, it, for those who receive those vaccinations and also more information about um, if the recommendation comes through, who specifically will be recommended to receive those vaccinations. So for the moment, we just have to, to hold on and wait. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Yagane, uh, when the vaccine is approved for children 5 to 11, will my daughter be able to get it at her school? And if so, can I be there with her? That's a, I mean, that's a great suggestion. I think that, you know, we do find that schools are a wonderful location for individuals to get vaccinated. Um, of course, you can go to your doctor, you can go to a pharmacy, but I, I love school-based clinics because it's such a, uh, a joyous location. People from the community um, really find that schools are the beating heart of the community, they do like to be there. So um, it would be wonderful if elementary schools as well could hold vaccine events. And I think that we will be working with elementary schools that are interested in trying to make sure that they can host vaccine um, events with our support. Uh, you know, middle and high schools have been hosting events all along this, this fall and even during the summer and spring. Um, so I think that it would be great to have those at elementary schools. I do think that you, we would do it at a time where parents could be there. So um, I think we would probably try to do it at a time that's convenient for parents as well. So either on the weekend, in the early morning, in the you know, afternoons during pickup sometime when parents could also be present. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for that suggestion. Uh, Dr. Davis, uh, I know this is top of mind for, we've gotten a few questions on this topic. Uh, how long will the vaccine mandates last? You know, we always look at this in terms of, of what's required to you know, protect people. Uh, and so, you know, they'll be there for as long as they're needed. Um, we also expect uh, that at a certain point, uh, we will see whether or not, uh, you know, it's going to be like influenza where each year there's a, uh, a shot that's needed um, in terms of protecting folks. So it remains to be seen, uh, but at this point, um, you know, this is what we have to needed to protect folks uh, given the situation that we're in right now. Thanks. And Dr. Davis, a question that just sort of got asked as well in there. So, um, isn't asking people to prove they've been vaccinated a violation of HIPAA? No, it's not. Um, you know, HIPAA applies to those organizations that are taking care of patients or uh, handling that information, and they have to to uh, make sure that it's handled in a safe way so your information is protected. Uh, but in terms of uh, someone asking you to show your own proof that you are vaccinated, uh, you know, that is something you have a choice to do. Uh, you do it, and here's what happens if you don't, and here's the other things that happen. But it, it doesn't apply to, to you showing your information. Uh, if someone has asked for it. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, we had a few questions about that as well. Uh, Dr. Tereshita, this is like a, a little bit of a two-part question. Um, how long does the virus stay in your body? I had COVID in December and I'm not, I haven't gotten vaccinated yet because I'm not sure I'm gonna be okay if I get the vaccine. Well, that's a good question. So there's been a lot of studies on this since COVID's been around for over a year now. Most individuals will have what we call infectious virus in their body for up to 10 days after they are infected. So this is why we have the isolation requirement that once you um, start your symptoms, you should isolate yourself for 10 days because studies have shown that after 10 days, you no longer have viable virus. Um, Individuals who are severely immunocompromised could shed viable virus for longer, but that represents a very, very small portion of the population. And if you had COVID and you're afraid of getting a vaccine, um, 
you should, you know, talk to your doctor, but the quick answer is that you absolutely can get the vaccine. And, and as Dr. Davis suggested earlier, you should get the vaccine. There's actually been studies that have shown that vaccine immunity is actually stronger than natural immunity. And people who have had both would actually have even stronger immunity. So we absolutely recommend that you get the vaccine. And what we usually say is you should not be symptomatic. As long as you're not symptomatic and you're outside of your isolation period, then absolutely you should get your vaccine to be protected. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. And I think it's really important. I mean, there's also, you know, we, we also, you know, after 90 days post your, your, your infection, if you get infected again, which lots of people do, that's counted as a new infection. So that, that natural immunity that you had, uh, you did have some, but it doesn't last forever. So, you know, go ahead, especially for those of you who were infected many months ago, uh, please, uh, you know, if, you, if you're worried, ask, talk to your doctor, but uh, by all means, go ahead and, and take advantage of, of getting vaccinated. Um, Dr. Curian, Curian um, a question uh, again, I, I think there's lots of different questions related to this that have come in, but they're really about, uh, I don't want to lose my vaccination card, but I'm nervous about carrying it everywhere with me. Uh, what are my other options now that so many places uh, want me to show that I've been vaccinated? How else could I do this? Yeah, no, that's a very good question and a very legitimate concern. Um, so you don't have to carry your vaccination card everywhere with you. Uh, you can, of course, if you want to, but you know there are other options. You can also take a picture of your vaccine card um, and keep uh, that picture on your phone, for example, and use that as a, a way of um, showing that you've been vaccinated. There are also digital records um, that are available. So if you go again to our, our uh, website, vaccinatelacounty.com, you can see how you can access, for example, the state uh, digital vaccine record. Um, LA County has also been partnering with Alfana um, that also offers a digital vaccination record. So these are things that, again, you can download onto your phone. Oftentimes they'll have a QR code and you can share that QR code with the facility that you're um, trying to prove your vaccination record for. So yeah, you don't have to carry the original around with you. Yeah, and, and I think it's a great question. Um, so, so there are rules about how to verify your vaccination. So, you know, it's not, you can't just show up with everything or, or you know, just say in most places, you can't just say anymore, oh, I've been vaccinated. Uh, but every place has to follow the same rules, which accept like four different proofs of vaccination. One of them literally is just take a picture with your phone of your vaccination card. What somebody needs to see is your name, and the dates that you got vaccinated and all of the vaccination cards, as you know, uh, to say which uh, vaccine type you received and the, they should include the lot numbers. So, you know, that will show up very clearly on your phone. Um, but there are, you know, there are rules and acceptable forms of vaccination verification, but that picture is one of those acceptable forms. Some of you may have also contacted the state because you lost your vaccination card and they didn't send you a new vaccination card. They just sent you a printout of your medical record saying you are vaccinated. That counts as well. So, you know, again, and, and you could take a picture of that. So I, I think there's flexibility and different ways of, of protecting that vaccination information. So you have it when you need it and it's not so easy to lose. But if you do lose it, uh, you can contact the state uh, and they will look through the state database, which keeps a record of everybody who's been vaccinated, uh, and they will send you, as I said, a new record uh, of your vaccination. So there, there is a, a one database that tries to keep everybody's records uh, so that, uh, you know, we, we can get that proof. If, you know, our dog ate it, it got wet, I didn't take a picture of it, now I've lost it. All those are reasonable things that happen to many of us. And the state does have this way for you to ask for your vaccination record. It just might take a few days, so beware of that. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Devane, my child has asthma. Is it safe for him to get the vaccine? He'll turn 12 next month. Uh, what a wonderful question. Of course, as parents, we're always trying to make sure our children stay safe. Um, we do know that kids who have underlying 
uh, conditions like asthma may be at higher risk for some of the complications with COVID-19. And we also know that the vaccine is safe and effective um, in children who have asthma. So to me, I would definitely uh, give him a birthday present of a COVID-19 vaccine and try to keep him as safe as possible. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Davis, uh, do gyms now have to require in LA County proof of vaccination? So at the moment, there may be some gyms that do require it. Um, they may do that on their own. And uh, many businesses that aren't required to do so under our order, uh, you know, can do that. Uh, but no, at this point, uh, under our order, that's there's no requirement for gyms to, to do that. Uh, but again, those gyms that do require it, you must comply. Uh, there is still the requirement that within gyms, uh, you know, participants uh, and the staff are supposed to wear their face coverings or uh, their face mask uh, because it is an indoor setting. Uh, but in general, uh, follow the rules of the business uh, and those rules that are dictated by the orders. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Tereshita, what's the difference between what we used to call a third dose and now a booster shot? <laughs> Well, I'm so glad someone asked this question because we're hearing these terms quite a bit in the news lately. A third dose of vaccine is really for, for those individuals who have some sort of underlying immune compromising condition that they don't mount an appropriate immune response to their first dose or to their second dose. So they need a third dose because they just never mounted a sufficient immune response. In contrast, a booster dose is for those individuals who did mount an appropriate immune response from the first two doses. But over time, six to eight months, that immunity has waned or lessened, and they need a booster dose to boost their immunity back up to protective level. I know the distinction is a little bit subtle, and uh, a lot of the news has been using these terms interchangeably, so I'm glad someone asked for that clarification. Yeah, me too. And it comes up a lot. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Kurian, uh, a couple of questions about uh, this as well. Are masks really effective at stopping the spread of COVID? I want to go to the Dodgers game, but worry about being around so many people who are not always wearing masks. That's a really good question. Um, so masks are an important component of sort of the toolbox that we have to fight the virus. So vaccination is of course, you know, central to that effort. Um, but there are other sort of infection control practices um, that we can use to help us. Um, and wearing a mask is definitely one of them. And other things include things like, you know, practicing social distancing, hand washing. So all of these things really re remain important. Um, and, you know, in general, and, you know, not just about going to the Dodgers game, but like when you're trying to evaluate any event that you might be going to, it's sort of important to consider what the potential risks might be of participating in that activity. So, for example, is it outdoors? Is it going to be really crowded? Are folks likely going to be unvac unvaccinated? All of these things sort of help you to make a determination about whether that particular activity or that um, event is, is safe to, to go to. Um, it is important to note, and I think Dr. Davis mentioned this, um, is that beginning in October uh, 7th, all individuals 12 and older are going to be required to show proof of vaccination or a negative test before they attend any large outdoor mega event uh, with over 10,000 individuals. So, for example, a Dodgers game, um, folks are going to have to start showing that they are vaccinated. Um, and the fact that it's outdoors, um, all of these things add extra layers of protection. Uh, of course, you want to make sure that you continue to wear your mask um, so that you can stay safe when you're attending um, games or any other events. Yeah, thanks so much. And, and we have some great guidance uh, on our website. Um, we do say, you know, you, ha you have to assess your own risk when you go to a place, Dodger Stadium, 55,000 people can be there. And you're absolutely right. They're required to wear masks except when they're eating or drinking, but lots of people are eating and drinking a lot of the time. So masks aren't on and people are cheering and uh, until October 7th, when we have additional layers of protection there, you've got to assess you know, what you're comfortable with because definitely going to a game where you're gonna be surrounded by lots of people you don't know who may not have their masks on uh, poses some risk. Now, 
you can mitigate your own risk by making sure you're vaccinated. Um, and you can also have a, you know, pretty substantial mask on that you're wearing. So if you upgrade your own mask, you use a KN95 or a respirator and N95, you got a lot more protection there. Um, but if you're a person that's around a lot of people who are not vaccinated yet or who have high risk of serious disease, should they become ill, you may want to evaluate, you know, what activities you're willing to go to um, as, you know, as we get ourselves all through this pandemic. Um, but yes, uh, there are uh, requirements already in place at these large events, and there will soon be more, uh, again, to, to enhance safety in places where we know, you know, just by the very nature of that activity, there can be more risk uh, in those, in these large mega events, like we call them. Um, I, I wanted to go to uh, Dr. Yagane. My school district isn't uh, mandating vaccines, but I really want them to. What can I do? Why won't you, being the public health department, why won't we a mandate that all schools require that students be vaccinated? Yeah, first of all, I want to um, thank you for advocating for keeping your schools as safe as possible using all the tools we have. Um, at this point, if a school district is interested in a mandate, it would be a decision uh, made by the district, meaning the school you know, board, the superintendent, the stakeholders in the school, including um, everyone, including the parents, the students, it has to be logistically feasible, it has to be acceptable. Um, so I think that, you know, talking to your school district or your school about, um, you know, is this a potential, is this something that they would consider would be a good first step. Um, my understanding, and Dr. Ferrer is, of course, the expert, is that public health doesn't have the ability to really mandate vaccines for all the districts. Um, it, it is something that would, if there, there could be legislation that could be introduced uh, in Sacramento um, for our schools in California, um, but at this point, it's a district by district decision or school by school if you're not in a district. Yeah, it's a great question, and, and I appreciate uh, your interest in this. And, and obviously, as it gains more support amongst parents and students, it's much more likely to happen. Um, I know that many school districts would like for this to happen statewide, that it's much easier to do, to take an action like requiring vaccinations for all students, if it's something, all students that are eligible, in this case, it's all students 12 and older. Um, it's much easier to do that um, if, in fact, it can happen statewide. And, and good examples are, of that are, in fact, that, um, you know, teachers need to be, teachers and staff at school all need to be vaccinated, and a lot easier to do that statewide as well. So I think there is a lot of interest at the state level, uh, whether that comes through uh, a state health officer order or that comes through some leg a legislative process uh, or that comes through the Office of Education and the superintendent of schools. I think there is a recognition that uh, some of these decisions, it's best to have uniformity. But right now, um, particularly since um, up until, since we're still waiting for full approval for children, for the vaccines that are used for children 12 to 15, um, you know, it really has been left up to the districts with all of us in public health uh, feeling like you do. It's super important at schools that we add this to a requirement on vaccination. So I, I don't wanna act like we don't have a position on this, we actually do. Uh, there are many vaccines that are required for children uh, in order for them to attend school. And this pandemic is the most devastating health crisis that we have faced in our lifetimes. Uh, and one of the ways to get, uh, get over the pandemic is to have more people protected with the vaccines. It's also the way we save a lot of lives. Um, so we're strong, we're in strong agreement uh, that it makes sense. Uh, we do know that people have to get their questions answered and logistically, we have to make sure we're able to provide the vaccines to everyone uh, all across the county in a way that's equitable. Uh, but we appreciate the advocacy on this. Um, and again, I think as time passes, uh, the FDA has indicated that they're looking at the data now to approve uh, the Pfizer vaccine uh, with full approval for children 12 to 15. I think that will reassure people that there's been a lot of data that's been looked at and uh, we can then all feel comfortable 
uh, with those requirements as we have for so many other vaccines that help protect our children and uh, everybody who's working in the school environment as well as everybody who's learning there. But that it, we appreciate your advocacy on this. Um, Dr. Davis, I, I wanna go back to masks for a second um, because uh, right after we answered that one question about masks being effective, uh, we did have somebody ask us uh, if the masks were gonna go away anytime soon and when would they go away? When should we not need those masks? Yeah, I appreciate that. That's a question we've gotten since we've we've put the, the order back in with the, the transmission going up. Um, you know, what we said and, and we've continued to repeat is, you know, we want to see um, the county uh, out of high or substantial uh, community transmission of COVID-19 before we would look at that, uh, at removing that or lifting that, that requirement. Uh, you know, it's pretty prudent during that time to, to make sure that we have as many levels or layers of protection in place uh, so that we can really see uh, that this is going away or has gone away. Uh, so that's where we are at the moment. So once we get to, to you know, below, uh, you know, the substantial transmission, uh, which I think will be moderate, uh, then we'll consider it given what the situation might be at that time. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Davis. Uh, Dr. Tereshita, uh, do I really need the booster? I'm 67. I had COVID and survived. I got both vaccines. Don't I have more antibodies? Oh, I'm glad you added your age in there because I think it's an important consideration for this. Um, this is exactly the, the discussion that's been going on uh, both by the FDA and the ACIP and now sits with the CDC. Uh, FDA and ACIP have both said if you are above 65, regardless of if you had COVID or not, you need to get the booster dose. So you need to get the initial two doses and then the booster dose. And then this is really based on a lot of studies that have been done now showing that, well, when people who are above 60 don't mount as robust an immune response to the initial vaccines as younger adults. Um, and we know that in general, antibodies wane over time in everyone. Um, but based on a lot of studies that have been done recently, it's shown that those over 65 would really benefit from a booster dose. So based on what the CDC, CDC says, either maybe tomorrow, maybe Monday, um, we, we will see uh, if we recommend a booster dose. Yeah, thank, thank you so much uh, for that. And, and also, you know, th these are really important questions that you're asking. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we just got dozens more. So we're, we're going to try to get through all of them. And if we don't get to your specific question, sometimes it's we have a pretty similar question um, that that might get you the same information. So so hopefully you'll you'll figure that out as well. Um, I want to go to Dr. Kurian because uh, we've got a few questions on this. Uh, does the Johnson and Johnson COVID-19 vaccine change the human body's DNA. What about the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine? So all very uh, good questions. And I know that folks are um, continuing to have concerns and, and questions about, um, about the vaccine. And, and I'll just make a, another quick plug for our webpage, um, vaccinatelecounty.com, because we have a ton of information there um, on just about everything that you would want to know about the vaccines how they work, um, what they're all about, when you should get them, where you should get them. Um, but in, in, um, to answer the question, uh, it's important for folks to know that none of the vaccines that are out there uh, change the human body's DNA. That's not how they work. They work with the body's immune system to help build up immunity to the COVID, um, uh, to the COVID virus. Um, so really important for you guys to all um, feel safe and confident that when you get these vaccines, that it is not uh, doing anything to alter your DNA in any way, shape, or form. Thanks so much. I, we, have, we have like 10 questions asking us about altered DNA. So I think, um, you know, we, some, sometimes, you know, folks put stuff out on social media and it takes on a life of its own um, but there, there is not a single person in public health 
uh, there really aren't uh, reputable and knowledgeable physicians um, who would at all uh, think you had anything to worry about in terms of altered DNA based on the vaccines that we're using. It's actually impossible for these vaccines to alter your DNA. There's no mechanism uh, that would allow for your DNA to be altered by, uh, by these vaccines and the way these vaccines work. And, you know, we wish that people wouldn't spread misinformation because it, it really uh, makes it hard, I think, for the rest of us to know what we should believe and what we shouldn't. But um, I'm just uh, being really honest about this. Uh, we would We would let you know if we thought that we were using any kind of medication that had any chance of uh, altering DNA, it would be really, um, it would be uh, just unconscionable for us not to share that information if it were true, but it absolutely is not true. Um, we're going to go on. Uh, Dr. Jagane, uh, how would I be able to tell the difference between flu and COVID, particularly for my children? Um, you know, and, and does it matter? <laughs> Yeah, so, um, you know, we are approaching flu season, and we were really lucky last year we had a very mild flu season, mostly because children um, weren't maybe at school quite as much, and we were all doing a really good job with our masking. Um, I'm hoping that maybe some of that will remain, but we are seeing flu uh, <coughs> happening, so I do want to encourage everyone to please get your flu vaccine. This is my opportunity to plug flu vaccines. Um, this is the time to go ahead and go to your pediatrician or go to your local pharmacy and get the flu vaccine to protect your children and yourself. Um, as far as what you could tell, how you could tell the two apart, the only way I think is really by getting a test. And luckily it seems like more and more places are able to test for both flu and COVID-19. So if you have fever, cough, body aches, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, I think the best thing to do is to go ahead and get that COVID-19 test and a uh, flu test if there's flu circulating in your community. Um, and then the question about doesn't matter, it does matter for many reasons. There is um, a medication you, you could take for flu. So if you are at someone who's at risk for complications, or you could potentially take a medicine to um, decrease the severity of your influenza course. Um, so, of course, you'd want to know if you had the flu. And of course, if you have COVID-19, we would ask you to isolate at home for 10 days. And we would also ask you to please uh, let us know who your close contacts are so they could also observe quarantine. So um, there's obviously a lot of things that we would do differently between flu and COVID-19, but they do present similarly. So please, please get tested if you have those symptoms. Thanks so much. And, and uh, Dr. Davis, we know that there's now a requirement uh, in October that everyone in the bar needs to be vaccinated, but how will we know if that actually is true? Is there going to be some kind of enforcement? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's something that we've continued to do throughout this pandemic. Uh, and, and every each day we actually do inspections uh, of businesses, uh, one, providing education on what the requirements are for their business, uh, and two, uh, if they're not in compliance, uh, you know, trying to, to do things to get them into compliance, um, usually through education, uh, but we could cite and find as well. Um, so our, our team uh, will be out uh, doing investigations uh, and making sure that uh, businesses are, you know, checking. Uh, you know, the vaccination status um, and really the, the way to think about this, this is what needs to be done to decrease the risk of exposure and transmission uh, in a setting where it can likely happen. Uh, so we hope that everybody's doing their part in terms of this and we're here to help businesses understand what they need to do uh, if they don't understand uh, and we'll provide them with assistance and education. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Tereshita, um, a few questions on this as well. One is, if I, if I receive my two doses of Moderna before April 1st, can I just go ahead and get the Pfizer booster shot? I'm 70 years old. Yeah, so we're still waiting for a lot of guidance. And we do get a lot of questions similar to this. Currently, the discussion up, up for debate is about the Pfizer vaccine only. So if you had your first two, two doses of Pfizer vaccine, 
it's been six months since your second dose, um, you would be eligible if CDC approves uh, for the, the Pfizer booster shot only. Now there's a lot of discussion about, well, can I mix them? Um, um, or, or like your question, if you had Moderna first, could you get Pfizer? The answer right now would be no. Um, if you did, it's what we would consider off-label, um, and you could discuss this with your clinician to see if it's right for you. But the recommendation from us would be no. Yeah, that's that's so helpful. Um, and and again, you know, from us, you're gonna hear us say, you know, there's lots of researchers and scientists looking at all of this information and uh, we have to trust them to give us really good advice uh, based on the science about what it is okay for us to do or not do, um, given that we're in the middle of a pandemic and, and things change as we've all noted and lived through. Uh, Dr. Kurian, uh, there's a few questions about this as well, around pregnancy and vaccination. If you have a high, if you're, if you have a high risk pregnancy and you're already 18 weeks pregnant, should you go ahead and get vaccinated or is it better to just wait until you've delivered your baby? So um, really good, good question. And um, if you are, you know, pregnant um, or even for those who are uh, considering getting pregnant, um, the recommendation is for folks to go ahead and get vaccinated. Um, in fact, there's been, you know, many professional medical organizations that you know, serve people of reproductive age um, that have really been uh, emphasizing that there's no evidence that COVID-19 can, um, you know, cause issues around things like fertility or impact the pregnancy. Um, and, and so the recommendation really is for vaccination. Um, it is important to note that um, pregnant women are at you know, greater risk of having uh, significant consequences from getting the actual COVID-19 infection, not only for themselves, but for their, um, their infant as well. So um, it would still be advisable to get vaccinated. But of course, um, as always, we do recommend that you have a conversation with your healthcare provider um, and speak to them um, and, and talk about uh, the benefits of uh, COVID-19 vaccination. Thank you. And, and Dr. Jagane, uh, we have some questions from parents about activities for children that are under the age of 12. So these are children that cannot yet get vaccinated. Uh, one of them is, what are the best ways for my daughter to stay safe? Uh, she plays soccer and is in close contact with other kids, but she's only 11. Yeah, so um, I think that the good news is soccer is one of those outdoor sports, so um, you are taking care of ventilation. I think the other thing you can definitely do is try to make sure everyone who is vaccine eligible does get vaccinated. That includes um, parents, coaches, team members, parents, those who can get vaccinated should get vaccinated. And finally, masking. I think having a comfortable mask that you can wear during um, while playing is probably another mitigation strategy you could use. So um, I know that sometimes when you're exerting yourself, it's really hard to keep that mask on, but there are some masks that seem to work well for athletes. Um, so trying to keep that mask on as much as possible when you're playing. Yeah, we'd also, you know, there, there, when, you know, we, we study outbreaks, you know, these are situations where on a team, there are three or more cases and it's clear that there was transmission among the team members or among the team and the staff that are supporting the team. And some things that we've noted that, that I think parents uh, could eliminate as risks is a lot of times um, it's not that the children have a lot of exposure when they're playing the game. It's what they're doing before and after the, when they're playing the game. It's being in locker rooms where they're really close to each other indoors, often poor ventilation, often not wearing their masks, talking loudly. Uh, it's going out and uh, doing events together like team parties, team sleepovers, travel teams, uh, a lot about transportation, having many, many children riding in the same car or on the same bus, super crowded, no masks. Uh, this turns out to be a lot of the time uh, where there's transmission. Um, and less so when they're actually just outside uh, playing the game, running, you know, soccer, you know, basically you, you run a lot and you're in a lot of movement 
Um, and as you know, Dr. Yagane pointed out, you're outdoors, but around that, the before and the after and the activities, the other activities that uh, your child may want to engage in, that's where there could be some risk and where you may be able to say, you know, uh, we're not going to, we're going to only carpool with one other family, you know, so to reduce our risk. We're not going to go to any tournaments where we're staying in hotels, uh, where we're not in our own rooms and, you know, where children are, you know, grouped together, five, six, seven children in a hotel room. That's where we're seeing a lot of transmission. And I, I think um, we can do a better job also making it clear that, you know, that's where risk could be reduced as well. Um, I want to go back uh, to to you, uh, Dr. Davis, um, and and just ask a question uh, again around, uh, you know, sort of where we are in in this pandemic. Uh, there's a very good question here about, you know, are we going to need to have another lockdown this winter? You know, that's another question that we could ask a lot about, um, and you know, it's it's been our uh, desire to not have to do that. I think we're in a very different place, uh, you know, with people being vaccinated and actually millions of people being vaccinated, even though there are still millions uh, who are still eligible and, and should be vaccinated. Uh, so, you know, we're hoping that we don't see what we saw uh, last winter. Um, you know, we have a, a very different situation when we first closed down. We had no testing that was widely available. Uh, and then when we went in the winter time, we had no vaccines. Uh, and so we needed to do things uh, that um, for things that weren't available in order to reduce risk. Uh, but it's our hope that we don't have a situation like that and that uh, everything continues to hold uh, and still goes down uh, as we get more people vaccinated. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, Dr. Tereshita, I think this is also a great question uh, that many people are asking tonight. Uh, I don't understand how come if I'm vaccinated, I can still get COVID. How is that possible? Oh yeah, that's a good question because that is something we say. You can still get COVID and you can still transmit COVID even if you're vaccinated. Um, well, but what we've seen, the study, what the studies have shown is that the vaccine prevents severe complications from the illness of COVID. So that means you reduce your risk of getting hospitalized or dying from COVID, which are obviously extremely important. Um, studies have shown if you get exposed, you can still get infected. You can still get a mild illness. And, and that is something that you have to be aware of. And one of the reasons why we still require individuals to wear masks indoors or in high risk situations. It just has to do with the way the vaccine works. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much for that. And, you know, we show a lot of data, um, you know, at, at our press briefings every week. And just one number always stands out is, yes, there are thousands of people who have gotten, who are fully vaccinated, who have gotten infected. But we have 5.5 million people that are that are fully vaccinated in LA County and less than 1% of them have become infected. So your chances of getting infected if you are fully vaccinated while they're there, um, and, and these aren't 100% perfect uh, vaccines as Dr. Tereshita noted, they're, they're really, really small in comparison to what happens for unvaccinated people where your chances of getting infected are frankly much, much higher. Uh, Dr. Korean, uh, also, I think some important questions coming in from parents uh, about vaccine safety. How long did they study the vaccine in children, and how do we know it's safe for them? Yeah, no, very good question. And um, so they have been studying um, vaccines in children for quite a while now, you know, after the vaccines were made available. But um, you know, they, they do want to make sure that they are absolutely safe for this population, and that's why they continue to collect data um, on uh, vaccine safety and efficacy in children before um, they, uh, you know, um, submit the data to the FDA for, re for review and um, before the FDA then takes that information, reviews it itself, and um, finally makes it uh, available to the general public. 
So I think as we noted earlier, um, there is some data that is now going to be uh, presented to the FDA for Pfizer for children under the age of 12, so for the 5 to 11. Um, they have at this point sufficient data uh, that they feel comfortable with submitting to the FDA. So uh, we're hoping that shortly we will see some uh, approvals for that age group, but for those um, of younger age groups and um, for um, vaccine efficacy and safety for the other vaccines for Moderna and JJ, uh, all of those studies continue and only after we get sufficient information and sufficient safety data uh, will that be presented um, to the FDA. Thank you. Nava, uh, Dr. Yagane, we, we also have, you know, another question uh, from parents. I want to thank all the parents for getting on. We know this isn't the best time uh, for many of you. We try to be as accommodating as possible, but we appreciate that you're on with us and we definitely appreciate all these great questions. Um, this is a question from a parent. Why would my child, why should I get my child vaccinated when they have about 0% chance of dying from COVID? Um, so, yes, this is an excellent question. You know, luckily we do know that children seem to suffer less severe illness than adults do. Um, that being said, it's unfortunately not a 0% chance. Um, it is a low risk of death, but we have lost hundreds of children in this country from COVID-19. And when it's your child who's hospitalized or gravely ill or intubated, it's your entire world. Um, so I, I don't want to belittle the effect of COVID-19 on families who've lost children um, who are otherwise healthy and could have, you know, continued to bring so much joy to everyone's life. Um, furthermore, even if you, you know, your child has a mild illness, they still can have things like long COVID, which is, you know, having symptoms for longer than expected for months. Um, it seems like some children will continue to feel fatigue, difficulty concentrating, won't be able to completely participate in um, regular athletic events and athletic activities. We have um, of several teenagers who used to be um, very high level athletes who had a really hard time uh, regaining that strength and endurance. And then finally, I would say that if your child um, is infected, there is this risk that they could give it to other people in their community who have not, um, who don't have that strong of an immune system. So a grandparent and aunt and uncle, um, school teachers, their, their, their team. So their team could also be affected and not no longer be able to play sports. So there's um, a lot of reasons to really protect your child. Um, and so it's for their health to keep them safe, to keep them healthy, to keep them fully engaged, to prevent long COVID hospitalizations and death, but also to keep the rest of the community safe as well. Yeah, thanks so much for that. And, and again, our hearts do go out. Uh, while the numbers, you know, seem small, I think uh, Dr. Yagane is right. You know, if it's your child, like it's not small. And, and every day there are hundreds of people in our hospitals that are children under the age of, of 18 uh, who are pretty sick. So um, so it is heartbreaking. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's what the vaccines do best is they prevent that, that heartache uh, for individual people and for us collectively as a community. Um, I, I, D Dr. Davis, uh, again, I, I want to switch back to some questions we're getting about sort of safety and different activities. Um, there's a, a really, I think, important question about safety in restaurants. Uh, should we be eating, even if we're vaccinated, are we safer if we eat outdoors still? And, um, you know, uh, how do, if we are going to restaurants, uh, what are some strategies for making that experience as safe as possible? Thank you, and it's a, it's a great question, um, a common question that I get asked even personally. Um, you know, the way that I would think about it, there, there are certain things that haven't changed. Uh, you know, being outdoors, uh, especially in an uncrowded situation, is safer than being indoors, uh, whether it's crowded or not. And if it is crowded indoors, uh, the risk of exposure is higher if someone is, uh, is infected with COVID-19. Um, they also understand that vaccinations, again, aren't 100%, uh, but they are an additional layer of protection uh, that have shown to be very effective at preventing serious illness and death and, and do lower the risk of being infected when compared to people who are not vaccinated. So the safest thing is to be outdoors if you're around others, uh, whether you're vaccinated or not. 
uh, and uh, you know that that would be uh, you know the the safest thing to do. Uh, but if you are going to eat indoors, uh, better that you are fully vaccinated uh, and you know continue to use your mask uh, when you're not actively putting food or or drinks in in, in your mouth or drinking uh, in order to lower your risk of exposure. Should someone in that location be infected, or should the virus be uh, hanging out in the air waiting for someone uh, to be infected? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so. Uh, thank, thanks so much for that. Um, Dr. Tereshita, there are a few questions like this. I'm going to try to sort of thread them together, uh, which is about approved treatments for people who are sick with COVID. There are some questions about uh, monoclonal antibodies and why is that it's so hard to get them and do they work? And there's also questions about uh, ivermectin uh, and is that a, a treatment for COVID? Um, so I don't know if you want to, I'm going to, I'm trying to put them together because I know we're running out of time, but if you're okay with that. Sure, no problem. So uh, currently monoclonal antibodies are an approved treatment for COVID for certain populations. It's for people who have some sort of high risk, if you're, um, immune, you're immune compromised or perhaps by your age, something that you and your doctor would determine and you are not very sick. In other words, you're not hospitalized, but you're still outpatient. And the way it's usually given is by some sort of injection, either an injection or an infusion. Um, and it is given in a healthcare facility. And um, again, it's prescribed by a physician. So you need to talk to your physician about it. I mean, it works. It does show, studies have shown that this has had uh, benefits in many individuals. Of course, um, there are risks to it too, so you want to make sure you discuss this with your healthcare provider. A lot of people who have COVID will get better without any treatment. Uh, as far as ivermectin, the answer is a quick no. It is currently not recommended for treatment of COVID-19. Um, there's been a lot of off-label, I'll use that term again, off-label use of ivermectin. We do not recommend it. Um, right now, it's only recommended for select parasites, um, again, that your doctor would prescribe for, but ivermectin is not a treatment for COVID. Uh, thanks so much uh, for clarifying that and, and giving people such good information about that. Um, Dr. Kurian, I think, um, yeah, we're gonna, we were gonna do this sort of just a couple more questions, but I think this is an important question for everyone. Uh, how do I report adverse vaccine reactions? Uh, and what are some of the vaccine side effects that would indicate a serious issue and I should report? So yeah, very good question. So that we do have a system called the VAERS system and that is, uh, is a system that uh, not only healthcare providers, but basically anyone can report in um, an adverse uh, reaction. So if you are uh, experiencing something um, that you feel might be a consequence of your vaccination, uh, you can report into that system and let them know that um, that you've experienced something. In terms of you know, something significant that you'd want to maybe see your doctor about, of course, you know, common side effects after vaccination might be things like some mild redness or pain at the injection site, you know, mild fever, uh, things like that. Um, but if you are experiencing anything like you know, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, um, uh, you know, anything that uh, is more concerning. Uh, you want to make sure that you contact uh, your doctor, actually call 911 or get to a healthcare facility right away, uh, because that is much more concerning for not just a mild, but maybe something um, uh, more concerning like anaphylaxis uh, or, or more, something more significant. Yeah, and, and, and I, I don't, uh, we, I don't know that I, we have um, on, on, that we can put up on the screen uh, where you go to report an adverse event. Um, but you can go to the CDC website, cdc.gov, um, and it'll link you to the reporting system. So for those of you who want to be able to report that something you feel like something went wrong, um, go ahead and go to the CDC website um, because that, that's the right place. They, they manage the system. And I do want to say that, you know, we have folks who work for us here at the Department of Public Health that are part of that monitoring system. Those reports come in every day. 
and people at local health departments, as well as people at universities, researchers, and scientists are all part of the review process. So people should know, like somebody will look at the report uh, that you file uh, and to make sure that it's included in the database or that if it's important, um, that somebody does follow up uh, to get additional information. So I wanna encourage people to go ahead, look that up and, and feel comfortable reporting. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, I wanna answer just one question and then let Dr. Davis uh, sort of close us out for the evening. Um, but I, I want to, there, there's one very important question that people are asking, uh, and we have numerous people coming with us, like once the CDC approves the Pfizer boosters, how soon is it gonna be here in LA County for people who are eligible to get their booster shots? And I wanna say we are ready to go right now. Uh, our provider network, there's 1,300 providers in LA County. These are sort of what we call uh, clinics that are permanent. Uh, these include pharmacies, they include hospitals, they include health centers, they include providers, uh, you know, medical providers, um, and they're ready to go. Uh, so once we know who's approved, uh, they are ready to go ahead and give that booster shot. They're already giving third doses to people who are eligible because they're immunocompromised and they're doing first and second doses. Uh, it's, this is the, the caveat here is you have to find a provider who's using the Pfizer vaccine. Not all providers are using Pfizer. So you're gonna need to go uh, online to my turn. Um, if you're a person who already got vaccinated, it's likely the same place you got your first two doses will still be offering Pfizer and you can go back there. Um, you can go to vaccinatelacounty.com or vacunatelosangeles.com and get information about what all the community sites are. But all those sites will be ready to go. We, we are just needing the information from CDC on eligibility in order to be able to go ahead and, and offer those boosters. But as a reminder, um, it is just for people who got their first two doses of Pfizer uh, six months ago. Um, so really before, uh, you got it before the end of March, uh, your two doses. And again, that was a limited group of people because we had scarcity at that time and not everyone was eligible to get vaccinated. Um, we do know that it's highly likely if you're 65 and older, if you're a person, with an adult with serious underlying health conditions, if you live at a skilled nursing facility, uh, you will be in this group and then we'll have to wait on what other uh, residents are gonna be eligible. Uh, but please, you know, go to our website. We'll let you know as soon as uh, the eligibility criteria has been approved so you can go ahead. I know that starting tomorrow, my turn, we'll be offering those appointments. Obviously, they'll be for some day in the future, uh, not for tomorrow unless we hear later tonight, which is unlikely. Uh, that there's been approval for a certain uh, select group of, of folks. But I would imagine sometime tomorrow or maybe Saturday or Sunday or Monday, uh, we will get the green light and uh, you'll be able to go ahead and get those boosters. If you don't, if you're willing to wait at a site, you can do walk-ins uh, at many of the clinics, including all of the Department of Public Health sites. Uh, and again, uh, we're ready to go once we... Uh, have more information from CDC on, on who's eligible. Uh, Dr. Davis, I, I wanna um, also, before I turn it back over to Dr. Davis to close this out, I wanna thank all of you for joining us. And more importantly, I wanna thank you for everything you do every single day to keep us safe collectively, to keep your families uh, safe uh, and to keep our community thriving. Uh, I also wanna thank uh, Dr. Kurian, uh, Dr. Tarashita, Dr. Jagane, and Dr. Davis uh, for all that they're doing, their leadership, and uh, for being with us tonight. And with that, Dr. Davis, if you don't mind uh, closing us out tonight. Thank you. And I, again, want to echo um, uh, my colleagues and thank them, as well as everybody who submitted questions and have stuck with us, uh, not only tonight, but throughout this whole time. Uh, you know, we've we've been here before where we've seen things start to come down and they've gone up uh, and we want to try to make sure that those things stay down. Uh, but it really is up to our us individually and collectively in terms of what we do. Uh, all of the numbers that report are actually people 
Uh, some of people have been affected by this that you know. Uh, but until we get things down to uh, a low level, uh, we were there June 15th, um, and we want to get back there and even lower than what we were. Um, we're going to continue to all have to do and take preventive measures uh, in order uh, to keep our businesses open, our schools open, and to keep uh, us uh, all collectively as well as we can be uh, during this time. Uh, I will remind you that as we've gone into October last year, that's when we started to see our increases in our holiday season. We are again hoping we don't see that, uh, but it depends on, on all of us in terms of what we do. Uh, so three things to do. Remember to wear your mask. Uh, remember to keep your distance uh, from, from others uh, and get vaccinated both for COVID or against COVID as well as against influenza. Um, thank you. And with that, um, I appreciate all of you once again.